Well, good evening all and welcome. And good evening to Dave O.T. And Dries van der Enden, good evening to you. Joseph King, good evening. Andy Best, good evening. And that's it, good evening to you. <laughs> that has got to be the uh, smallest good evening I've ever done. But then having said that, a um, fairly well-known football team is playing tonight. Good evening, Andrew. How are you? And welcome. And I have no misimpressions about this evening that there's not going to be many of you here, and I quite understand why. But I've missed you all, so I decided, what the hell? And uh, Pete and... Um, what's his name? Mark, that's the fella. Pete and Mark decided that um, they were interested but mark was afraid to watch it because every time he watches it they lose but that's been the case since 1966 doesn't matter who watches it they lose uh good evening rubber dub good evening james and rob good evening to you martin gentle turn good evening and woodworm paul good evening to you sir and very welcome and good evening to you terry tj turning welcome to you i i have to say something um before I, I mean, half past seven, I'll do the proper hello to everybody. But um, just to let you guys know, I have done my back in. Um, strange as it may seem, I'm standing is easier than sitting and then standing. So uh, there might be a. I'm hoping not, and I, I'm hoping it's not going to go on extremely long tonight anyway. But um, hopefully, I'll be able to stand the course. A little hero I am, aren't I? Chris Spinningwood, good evening. Barry Fisher, good evening to you. And John Augustuson, good evening. How is it on the other side of the pond? It's fine, thank you. Gordon Hill, good evening to you. And Woody Schmidt, good evening. And welcome. David Vaughan, good evening to you as well. And welcome. Well, I have to be honest, I'm not going to go on about this all night. I mean, there are 42 of you in there at the moment, and uh, I didn't think I would get 24. So I'm very pleased. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. And Colin. I beg your pardon? It, <laughs> yeah, I really wanted to know that. I was uh, That was really something that I was uh, extremely um, uninterested about. But that, nevertheless, thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah, it's eight o'clock, isn't it? Eight o'clock. John Laverine, good evening to you. Paul Steffigan, good evening to you, sir. Peter Corcoran, good evening to you. Michelle Higgins, or is it good evening to you, sir? Is it a sir or a madam? I do apologise. I'm Welsh, so I, that is my... Gordon Hill, good evening to you. I think I said good evening to you once, Gordon. That's it. Now, you owe me 10p. If I do two good evenings to the same person, 10p goes in the pot. Uh, Steve Robbins, good evening to you, sir, and welcome. Do, 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 do. Burnt Hickory Signs, good evening to you, and welcome. Miss T, hello, T, good evening, welcome. Before I came into the garage, T, I looked over towards your area and I thought it's a bit dark over Will's mums, so maybe you've got rain and we haven't, and we've got a Got it coming. Chris Nunn, good evening to you. Hi, I'm in, says Chris. Jordan Woodworks, good evening, sir. And how are you? And welcome. Webfoot Resin and Wood Creations, good evening. And welcome to you, sir. And Gav, good evening to you, Gav. Dave Oti, Mike Walt, can't hear the worms. Can't hear the worms. Can you, uh, right, um, no, you haven't said a, right, could somebody say if they can hear the worms, please, they are talking, will you talk, lads, please? <laughs> Bit more enthusiasm, huh? <laughs> I know, yeah. Please check, Pete, we can't hear him. Can you hear Mark? Go on, Terry. Uh, uh, Pete, have a, have a go. Yeah, no sound. No, no, they can't. They can't. They can't. They can't. They can't. They can't. 
Are you sure NDI source has, oh no, that gives doubly. Desktop audio is on and uh, my headset is on. And that's all. I'm sorry? Needs to be pointing at the headset. What do you mean by that? So if I go into settings, yeah, it should tell you what source it's, it's picking up from. It's not. Oh, ah, here you are then. If I say Jabra, ah, okay. <clears throat> Yeah, because there, there was an update. Right, guys. Um, sorry about this. People in the audience, could you please listen to Pete and Mark again and see if you can hear them? Hopefully we now have the right setting on Mark's and mine's audio. Hopefully you can hear both of us, despite what Terry says. Yep, that was it. You can hear now. That's brilliant. OK, thank you very much. Okay, that's good. There's always something, uh, but there was an update on, uh, I think the update, yeah, there was an update because I haven't used it for a couple of weeks. Yeah, the Jabra update, wasn't it? Yeah, and um, that was, that's okay, but it's all the, I mean, I've only been doing it since last year, so I mean, I can't be expected to know it. Um, let's have a quick look back. If I've missed anybody saying hello, Robert Dolman, good evening to you. Um, but did it do? I've said hello to all you guys. Let's just go back through the chat a minute. I think I said hello to Andy Best and good evening. Steve Hale, good evening to you and welcome. Um, I think that's about it, isn't it? David Vaughan? No, but yes, you can hear now. So everybody can hear now. And uh, Paul has said, yes, it's wonderful. This is going back a bit that he couldn't hear you guys. My feelings exactly. My feelings exactly. Oh, cheers. That's my pleasure. I have to actually um, commend Mark when I asked him to say something. He said, da, 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 da. can you hear me? <laughs> he didn't really care if you could or not. Not like me, of course. <laughs> but, um, okay. Right, it's nearly half past seven. And what I'll do is just go to the, um, the I'm going to call it the test card. Brian Hart will turn in. Hello, Brian. We have a we we have a a jock in the house. <laughs> Troublemaker. Yeah. Well, I know. Yeah, I know. I, I I can never I can never do a Scottish accent. I can't even do a Welsh accent now. Apparently, according to my friends, when I was over there on the weekend. Um, and for any of my colleagues watching, which I'm sure they won't be, they'll be watching the football. Don't go run into our boss saying, "Oh, Mike Waltz on the sick," and yet he's doing a video. It's all been explained, and the type of back injury I've got allows me to stand for a certain time uh, as long as I keep moving. Um, it's sitting down and then getting up is the problem. It took me just over an hour and a quarter this morning to be able to walk under my own steam, if you like, after I got up. But, yeah, um, I had that problem after a lot of vodka. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I had that problem last Friday when I was visiting Wales. Uh, Jerry Dempsey, good evening to you and welcome, sir. And I have just a basic, good evening, how are you? Welcome. And I have to say, and I, I'm not saying this for any other reason than it's totally true, I am absolutely gobsmacked that there's 70 people here. I really am. I'm sure by 8 o'clock there'll be 7, if that. But nevertheless, I'm going to have a quick, a quick drink, a quick drag, and then we'll go into it. And please, as usual, um, I'll say that in a minute. So we'll go to the test card for a second, and I shall be with you now. You've gone for the test card. I'm not sure if we're off our audio as well, but... I think I'm probably still here. We 
better not slack Mike off too much though, because he could probably hear us too. <sighs> Good evening, Shay. <laughs> I can hear you. I can hear you. Andy, Tlesi, how are you? Pleased to meet you, mate. Again, and welcome. Right, let's go to the big ugly face. Okay, this is the official greeting. Good evening, all, and welcome. And uh, I'd like to, as usual, introduce my pit crew. And we have, seeing he's in picture, Mr. Mark Beckett, a.k.a. the Gentleman Woodturner. Hi, everyone. And also... Hello to me. And also him, uh, Pete Ravenscroft, a.k.a. No, so Pete so Twisted good. Trees. No, nope, we'll... you're still Mark. <laughs> It'll change in a minute. There you go. There he Hi, is. Everyone. There's Pete. Who was that? Who was that whispered in my ear? But you better keep on, Mark. My goodness. Good evening, Anne Philixis. Good evening to you and welcome. I think I said hello to Lawrence earlier on. And good evening to you, Robert. Uh, Robert, Lawrence. Okay, Charlie Taylor. Good evening to you, as well. Okay, um, this evening. Um, didn't think I'd be on, but I am. I won't go into details why. Uh, so what I'm basically going to be doing tonight is going through my personal uh, way of, let's say, designing a goblet, what I look for in aesthetics. Now, anything uh, which is on show to anybody has different connotations. Everybody has their preferences. This is obviously nothing is set in stone with regard to design and desirability of design because everybody has their own ideas of what looks good and what doesn't. The idea tonight it was to give you what I uh, consider, if you like, and how I hopefully on occasion achieve what I'm looking for and I think all of us are not guilty but have this situation where we actually have an idea in our heads of what we want something to look like um, but through the medium of the lathe and the tools and the wood you're using etc sometimes getting that shape it, it doesn't always work um, and when it does it's a great feeling when it doesn't you, you either get annoyed or you actually have a design change I don't mean as a result of a catch or anything just oh well it's gone wrong I'll, I'll do something else with it and I think in the beginning beginners and intermediary stage that's fine because you're still turning you're still honing your muscle memory and turning which is important but as you get more experienced I think with more um, more time behind the lathe you need to start trying to achieve the goal you have or as near as can be done. And there are certain things that I don't like when I see them um, and it just doesn't appeal to me. It doesn't mean to say it's wrong. So the first thing I'm going to look at is the, funny enough, goblets. Let's have a look at goblets. Why not? I've turned one or two in my time and I've broken more than one or two in my time. Um, with a goblet, if we look at the foot, the foot is the uh, the base of the goblet, and there are three main shapes of a foot. You have a straight foot, or a flat foot if you like, then you have a um, convex shape coming from the stem, convex, and then you have, my preference, the concave, the one that sort of like just melds into the stem. And this, I could be here for three days trying to get up, no, hang on. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm going to do, I'll go to the overhead and we will put in, this is just all, all the stuff today, there's nothing going to be finished or anything, I'm just going to go through the process. This is a piece of oak, um, it was about 22% yesterday, um, so it might not be running as true as it could be. Now. This is, if you can imagine the goblet coming up here, this is a flat base. Now, the only time that I use a base of that nature is when I'm doing a wet goblet turning, because the idea with a wet goblet, the same as with a bowl, uh, to aid even turning and reduce the risk of cracking, everything needs to be the same dimension. So that black mark there, that indent there, would represent where I would part off. So rather than have a concave aspect to it or a convex, it's flat. If you do a con, uh, concave, I'll go through that now in a minute, um, you have to mirror inside. So you have to undercut to try and keep the walls of the base the same 
thickness and that will reduce the risk of cracking. So again, let's pretend that the goblet comes up here. And no, this isn't one that I broke. I actually turned down to there. Um, we have the first uh, possibility. I believe you, Mike. You can see it's wobbling very slightly there. That's just where it's drying out. Because I say it was about 20 odd percent. Yesterday. The goblet flew off. Sorry? That's where the goblet flew off. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> that has happened before. Now, the, this is the one design where, as I say, it's flat. Now, the other design is when it's not flat. So what I'm going to do now is to do the other type of design. And it does look, in my opinion, A little bit, if I say clumpy, would that, uh, it wouldn't be that big. Nice and easy. Just lifting the handle now, going towards the stem like that something of that nature so you you have that um, that look and then you would you would part off if you can um, imagine you would part off let's say somewhere there okay so it's parted off there so that is how you're foot would look and don't worry i've got a, a blank here where i've actually turned the goblet and we can go through the various um shapes and then you can see what it looks like aesthetically now that is not my in any shape or form it doesn't matter if it's a large goblet if it's a tankard uh, i don't like that base not a tankard sorry but a sort of a um what they would call it an um not a Roman, a Roman goblet or a Gothic goblet, whatever, sort of fairly chunky stuff. I just don't think that fits. I, I don't know why. It's just a personal thing. I don't like it. Um, so what we'll do now. OK, I'm, I'm turning it around 2000 revs now. OK, that, that's what I prefer to do. My preferred design is as follows. So again, just pick up the cut, lift the handle, so I'm starting to get a concave shape. You can already start to see it. And then, as I say again, from we'll go from where this is, uh, where the end is. Um, Nick Castle. Eric oh, yeah, sorry, I... <laughs> <laughs> you gave me a bit of a shock there. Yeah, go sorry. on. Sorry, it's all Nick right. Cast Nick Castle, Eric Winkler and Rob C.B. have all joined. Oh, and Jeff, Rob C.B. I've seen, yeah. Nick Castle, good evening to you. And Tony Eastham, I don't think I saw you either. And good evening to you and welcome, sir. Um, and as I keep saying, I'm just looking at the screen here and I'm absolutely gobsmacked that there's over 100 people here. So, um, and don't feel guilty if you feel the need to watch England lose to Italy, not a problem, be my guest. Okay, and I'm only joking, so I, don't, I don't really care, I don't really care who wins. Um, <laughs> okay, so, um, again, when someone talks, it's Can we go not... your camera, Mike? Oh, uh, well, do you really want to see what I'm doing? Okay. Yeah. So, oh, here we are, around the 2000 RPM business now. So, I'm going to carry on now to the stem, so I'm looking for concave design. Just get your cut. Lift the handle and then ease out. Now, did the camera pick that up? Yeah, it does. You can see already we've got that um, that shape. Now, to me, that is the sort of shape I like 
where it blends into the stem. Now, again, it depends on the type of bowl you've got, the length of the stem, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But there are variations on that theme as well. Sometimes exaggerating, where where this um, detail is here, you can make a feature of that as well. And all you need to do, my tool rest needs to come down a tad. There we go. Uh, you can make a feature of that, and you can like roll roll this edge over uh, to give the impression almost that the and blend that into the stem there almost giving an impression of it's coming in and it's actually a three-part goblet if you like and you can actually undercut that a bit as well i've done that too and the advantage of having that that is a bit exaggerated i would have that a bit smaller under normal circumstances um it, it, it does lend itself to the possibility of a little bit of decoration maybe a couple of burn lines or something to add a bit of interest to it so I'm not looking at the stem design, um, the possibilities, what you can do on the stem. You can put a little bead at the bottom if you wish, but that's just the foot. So I personally think that that type of design um, suits the base of a goblet in the majority of cases. And that's just my opinion, of course. Um, Jennifer Stralton's in as well. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening and welcome to you, my dear. And Wyvie, good evening, Wyvie. Eric Winkler, I think I didn't say good evening to you and a good evening to you as well. Um, now, the what we can do here, and this this will cover a couple of things. You'll notice- And Mark them, Bade as well, sorry, Mark Bade. Oh, Mark, good evening, Mark Bade from the States. How are you, my friend? Nice to see you and welcome. Uh, you see a little mark, pencil mark there. I always do that on, if I've taken anything out of the chuck, I always make a little mark. So uh, that gives me the possibility of getting it back as near as possible. And I always do, I always happen to do it on uh, jaw number one, but it's not essential. But this won't run through because it's dried out since yesterday. Uh, and in fact, it'll have a bit of a wobble on it because that was turned yesterday and it's obviously drying out so it's it's not true but i don't worry about that it's not a it's not a problem for what i'm doing now so what i've got there is what i would personally term a sort of a classic type bowl uh, shape okay um i quite like again having a bit of detail here um which is adding a little bit of interest to the goblet. And the thing is, when you go down here, down the stem, you get further down, you could either, you could actually mirror that. We're not talking so much about proportions here, but you, if you mirror that here, if you get the same um, size of that shape on the bottom end, um, it looks quite nice, but that to me only looks good in a shorter goblet, not a long stemmed goblet. But again, that's personal choice. Um, so on a standard, what I would term a standard shape, that is a, um, it's a nice little feature to have. Now, what I've intended to do, but because we've got this drying out, I will use the old tennis ball um, and that should just give a bit of stability. Now, whether it's whether it's warping or not, my personal opinion, it's a bit like bringing the tailstock up when you're doing a bull. It gives you extra safety and stability. Uh, and the, it, it doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's a short goblet or a long goblet, a long stem goblet. Putting a bit of support at this end is never a, it, it's never really. Uh, an error is it because you having that and you don't put a lot of pressure there's not a lot of force there it's just to give it that little bit of stability now that is still running out of true so with a tennis ball you can you can knock that off and you can feel it and you can fiddle around this is just a, a, a little tip if you like or one of the techniques 
and that then that's too bad again so you undo it drop it down and all you're trying to get is is get it as and that's really bad is it not yeah so take it away let it spring back and then put the tennis ball into the cup try it that way and then we're up a bit there so all you've got to do is loosen it off a bit drag it there and that is virtually the same. it's no worse than it was before but you've got some stability there and to me you will notice it when you're doing any turning at this end because if that is if i take that away I'm sorry to go on about it, but it's quite important. If I take that away and keep the revs the same, okay, it's got to be spinning around, but it's got, as you go quicker, it's it, it's got, believe you me, it's happened. What's got to happen is that's got to increase on the centrifugal force and it's going to snap. If you've got any weakness anywhere down the stem, especially if the stem is down here somewhere, that is going to increase, increase, increase the faster you get. And if you want me to prove it to you, I will do it now, not a problem. But you don't want to be turning at 600 revs because you've got quite a bit of work left to do. Um, so what you would do there, as I say, in my opinion, and I found it worked very well, you can either use that or, just out of interest, if we use the, this is something I turn for when I do spheres, and because it's solid, and it's tapered that might actually it has there we go that there there's no pressure on there at all now you look how how different that is that is really hardly it's still moving a bit there and i could even let a little bit of pressure off there because we're not looking for pressure we're just looking for stability um and that is a better option than the tennis ball in this case because it's uh, tapered back and it sort of self centers if you like but it doesn't it won't center this because this is actually warped for want of a better word but when you're working on this now you've got that confidence to know that um, if you want to turn at faster revs to get a better cut or you want you just turn faster than 600 rpm you know that that centrifugal force is not going to snap your goblet off and i had that happen um at a demo I was doing at UKIS a few years ago, and I actually virtually competed the goblet, thin long stem goblet, and uh, I hadn't turned the lathe speed down, so I turned it up and it was doing about 2,000 RPM, and it just went, it said, bye, <laughs> and it, it went, so there. So, okay, we've got this goblet now, it's not going to be an extremely long goblet, but a long stem goblet, but we've got the start up there of a what I is that too bright if I do that? No, that's good. It means I can see what I'm doing. We've got there the uh, beginnings, if you like, of a convex foot. Okay, so now you've got the goblet to look at. I'm just going to complete um, complete that as a rounded foot. Okay, so it'll give you an idea of what it'll look like. Good round Paul's got a question. Yeah. He says, where did you get the rubber bung from, please? This rubber bung, or the one that I... Yeah, yeah this one I made. It's, only, it's a piece of uh, piece of ash. And... Um, so it's, a, it's a wooden cone. It. It. And what I did is, um, I've got a beel tap. And I tap the thread that fits into the one-way live centre. Have you got a side view camera, Mike? Sorry? Have you got a side view camera? Yeah. Because we can, we can only see your head. Oh, that's, but you know why, don't you? It's because I'm concentrating. You won't see my head anymore. I'll keep back. I'll keep okay. back. So, thank you, Mark. Now, you can either use your, um, in this case, it's a half inch spindle gouge. You can either use that, I've got to get some more speed on this. Okay, to blend that in, bearing in mind, this is not my favorite foot. And then I could use, I'll use a little diddy skew. And because I've got uh, the support here at the end, I don't need to put my fingers underneath to support the stem. Just very light cuts with the skew. 
just to bring the stem down. Bearing in mind it's not true here, so you're going to get a bit of bumping. Uh, no need to worry um, about that because it won't be visible. When you've done your sanding, you, 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 you won't notice. Nobody will notice the difference. And then all I've got to do then is just blend that in. Come round. And here, come round. Just make make that up with the with the stem and then a little bit more with the skew. And the only reason I'm spending time on this, I just want you to look at it and see if you understand what I'm trying to say with regards to the shape of the foot. Okay, so that is one shape for that goblet. Now again, if you um, can imagine that the goblet will be, let's say, parted off, so from, the, from here to the top is where it'll be parted off, um, I think that looks a bit clumpy. Although it's a short stem goblet, it's a stubby goblet, I don't particularly like that design. And I certainly wouldn't like the other one if I can find it. Someone's nicked it. Where's my flat one gone? Anyway, um, that's really weird. Excuse me, uh, I'm just faffing about here trying to find the, um, the flat stem that I did. The one that it I showed on the floor. Did it? I don't think so. Well, that's really strange. We got gremlins in here. Somebody, <laughs> some, somebody's nicked it. Never mind. But I, I can assure you that with a goblet of this design, if you've got a straight flat base, it will not look. It to me, it looks totally out of proportion. So, okay. There's another thing to consider before you decide which shape you're having, and that is the diameter of your foot. Now, I like to have my um, the base of my goblet, unless certain circumstances dictate otherwise, but the majority of the time, either the same diameter as the widest part of the goblet bowl, or slightly smaller. Because if it's bigger, again, you get what I call the clumpy look. It looks a bit bottom heavy. So you want to get it sort of in between the two. And that isn't always as easy as it sounds. But what I, the little trick that I do, um, and I won't bore you with it tonight, but the little trick that I do is make my part in off point and then take the chuck off or take it out and look at it and visualize, no, that is too big. So the um, design that I prefer, which you know I'm going to say, it's nice and slow, lifting the handle slightly as you're going towards the middle, moving to the left now as I'm approaching the stem. Now I'm going to stop there for a reason, but already you can see we've got the concave look and you want to try this is a piece of oak and if i go to the camcorder and zoom in and hopefully it'll stay focused um andy andy Clanetley has pointed out yes it is actually quite funny you have, you can't find the flat bottom one anymore because you changed the shape of it do you know, Andy, uh, th that was tonight's deliberate mistake to see if everybody was awake or whether they were half watching England or half watching me or neither. Um, that's my excuse. And thank you, Andy. It took a Welshman to find out and make the comment. I had a feeling that had happened, but I don't know. Yes, you're right. It was that one. <laughs> well done, Andy. Cheers, mate. Um, OK. Um, <laughs> I love these things. Anyway, um, you can see there that there's, it's quite a nice surface. I say this this is oak, it's not dry, but it took a nice, uh, a nice surface because I was able to do a complete cut to the end. So there are no minimal sanding, blah, blah, blah. Now, the important thing is the design, as I keep saying, whether 
you personally feel that that on this sort of a goblet looks better than the round over type i personally think it does now here you've got another opportunity to play around a bit and say well do i want a do i want a little bit of a detail here and what i do when i get this to this stage is i play around with it and if i don't like it i just turn it away and just have the foot just blending in to the stem i've got a little bit of meat there to play with as well because it's not quite the same diameter as the rest of the stem but another thing for the newer turner is don't worry too much about your uh, exact tool finish here this believe it or not was done off the tool i've done no sanding on any of these at all and i took the opportunity to practice a bit of skew for my final cut and it happened to go fairly well which leaves a nice surface for me to less abrasion and less chance of radial marks blah 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 um, the same thing down here when you're doing your stem and i think this is a worthwhile time to say it if i want to knock this down to the same diameter as the rest of the stem here i would you normally use my half inch spindle gouge okay because you can you can do that on the wing and just use it like a skew if you like just nice light cuts and you can bring it down nice and gently i won't bring it right down because as i say it's also an opportunity to have a bash with your skew if you haven't got a little duddy skew, you've got plenty of room here now. You can use your one inch skew or whatever, but it just gives you an opportunity to pick that tool up and practice a nice, fine cut. OK, um, and the only reason I'm saying that is that's what I do. I use each because I'm not a pro turner. I'm not a production turner. I use every project I'm doing an opportunity to use different tools on it. I have my preferences, but on the day, you know, if you if everything's going well, then you're using one tool. Stick with it, of course. Uh, this is where us as hobby turners have the luxury of being able to experiment with things. So, OK, we, we've got that melded into there. Now, I could um, keep that going undercut there that's quite nice and then maybe just do um let's get my what i'll do there is get my 3 8 spindle gouge and maybe i could what um would i do an undercut i don't know so there you know does that look all right yeah maybe it does maybe it doesn't um that isn't too bad you can play with it and say mm, do i like it do i not like it okay the worst scenario is you get rid of that bump and you just blend the whole of the foot into the stem uh, unmuted right okay um i <laughs> there's that all right we'll we'll keep that as a design that is the design that I possibly would go for, okay? Um, and then the other design, of course, is to get rid of that, that detail there and just blend this into the foot. And what you're doing here is just feathering into the cut and bringing it round in a nice arc. And you think, oh, hang on a minute. I wonder, hmm, do I want to bring that right down to there? Or am I going to do what that old Welsh fella said earlier on? Maybe I'll do a little bit of a round over here and see how that looks. So you've still got options. So lift the handle, pick up the cut, and just take it to... And if you go a little bit too far... Just pick up your skew and blend it in. As we were discussing the other day, Mike, a yeah. lot of these designs, they exist. I mean, this is a, a chalice. Of course. Yeah, uh, indeed. Go and look at your glass cabinet, see what they look like. Yeah, I totally let, agree. Let the design that has been used in the industry guide you you don't have to invent these things yourself it's already no. out there I don't, I don't think anybody can honestly invent the wheel anymore 
Um, yeah. There are there are connotations of virtually everything out there already, but it, it's what first and foremost, if you're not doing a commission or you're not turning something to somebody's specification, you are the designer, um, and you know deep down if it if it if it's, it looks good to you, or if that could do with a bit of tweaking on the next one or even this one, you know. Um, not not wishing to go from goblets to bowls, but th that sort of design that I've got on this little bowl here, this sort of OG shape here. Now, that is something that I find or found until I spent quite a bit of time practicing it, um, quite difficult to achieve. I could get a sort of a, I can get an in, I can get a convex and a concave, of course I can, but it doesn't look good. You, you've got to get the balance right. And the beauty of having time to practice is you can take a piece like that and you can take it to a matchstick and you can start off and then you can see what you need to do. Stop, look, see. And a lot of the time, I mean, if you're demoing, for example, I don't mean a demo like this. I mean, a demo where you're at a club or something like that, then you have to hone your skills. But that's what you would do. You would get that down to a fact where you get to that demo and you can do it, you know. But Mike, when you're... Andrew... Andrew Lorman Pearson's got a question. He says, Andrew, should, should the bottom of the stem match the bottom of the bowl in profile? Um, in profile or in diameter? You said profile. He says, he says in profile. <clears throat> right. OK, if we go to the overhead, then um, if you say profile, then that to me, the shape from the rim to the base is the profile of that goblet bowl. And if you're telling, if you're asking me whether the base should mirror that, if you like, in other words, you would have what you would, in that case, you'd have a convex base. Now, but he says the bottom of the stem. This it's here. Not, yeah, not I sure. Yeah. Um, you're talking about the, they, each end of the stem should they match? Ah, not necessarily. Not necessarily. I mean, I have, if you excuse me, going off camera for a minute. Um, got these little, I mean, these are these practice pieces. Um, and this is well, actually when I put them on Facebook. There's this one here, that one there, right? Now, that is a short little oak goblet with a what I term a sort of fairly classic standard bowl. Now, no way does the bottom of this stem mirror the top. It's a little bit of detail. It might be a bit fussy to some people, but it was just a practice. Now, in that instance, there is still a convex um, base to it, but it is slightly undercut on the rim, very, very slightly. And I, I just try all these different things and look at them and say, well, I didn't even finish the bottom of that one. Look. <gasps> because it's basically a practice piece. But, I mean, if you feel, Andrew, that that's how it should be, then that's how it should be. I don't think that they have to mirror... Um, if we go back to the overhead again, I don't think you have to mirror that at the base. I have done it. Uh, it looks good in some instances. It does depend how long the stem is in relation to the diameter of your bowl. But yes, it does work. But it also this feature here, I like whatever happens at the bottom, purely and simply because it just adds a bit of interest, almost makes the, the when it's finished and sanded and got a finish on, it almost makes it look as if the bowl is sort of like um, riding above the stem almost, you know? I would go in a bit deeper there with a the skew and make that almost a shadow under there. So, it, you know, it, it just adds a bit of interest. Of course you could add it here, but for this particular one, if I... I personally think if I, that works okay up here, but if I put that design on the bottom of the stem and then put the foot on, I think that would be too clumpy. Again, it's too big for there. I could mirror the design, but it would have to be smaller in my opinion. And if I make that smaller with the diameter of the bowl, in my eye, it would be too small for the diameter of the bowl. These are the things that I think of. Um, it doesn't mean to say it's right, but I have these not set in stone, but I look at it and I think, OK, what, what you were saying there uh, with the, the fillet, call it the fillet at the base of the bowl of the goblet there, that's a certain diameter. And in, to my eye, that um, balance is OK with the shape and the diameter of the bowl of the goblet. If I mirror that at the bottom, as I've already said, with a stem of that thickness, it's not a thin stem, but it's by no means a chunky stem, then 
in my opinion, whatever I do with that foot, what's going to draw the eye is that almost like a canker at the bottom of the stem. That's in my view. I'm not saying that's correct, but it doesn't look right to me. I have done hundreds of goblets over the years, and that doesn't mean I'm an expert. What I'm saying is I have done hundreds of goblets, and there aren't that many that I can stand back and say, yeah, I'm really happy with that. There's always an element of that goblet that I think is either out of proportion, doesn't look good if it's in there. Um, sometimes plain is best, like with the bowl. I was talking to Pete the other day, and he said, yes, he went through the phase of everything out to have an OG on it. Now he likes the, you know, a straight classic bowl design. There is nothing cleaner and better looking than a classic bowl design. And that possibly is the most difficult shape to perfect. The classic of, simple bowl. Talking yep. of design, Marcel Duret's got a question. Mm -hmm. How much does colour or figure of the wood affect the oh. design? Oh, I'm glad you said figure of the wood. Um, yes, it does Qu quite a bit. Um, it, it, I mean, you can, that is only a very basic sort of what I call trumpet come OG shape, but that works really well with highly figured woods. Um, and also, the other thing, I don't know if any, well, a few people saw it. I did a bowl the other day and it, I just enhanced the grain, an ash bowl with some uh, bronze embellishing wax and it just brought out the grain. And because of the shape, because the shape was sort of og ish the, um, what I call the highlight grain in, in, in most ash was really sort of distorted and, and accentuated it, you know, not, not the, not the color through the embellishing wax, but the actual design wasn't uniform as it would be on the side of the log it would have been had the shape but because it was uh coming um from the base out like that either side it almost looks like it was jumping out of the base of the bowl so yes the, the a, a long answer to a short question the figure in the wood and indeed sometimes a type of wood but maybe the figure of the wood as i've got more experience i do tend to look at a piece of wood and decide which end am I going to do this on? Which end am I going to do that on? Uh, will it look good uh, if I do an off-center turning with it? No, it's going to ruin it. It most probably would anyway, because it'll fly off the lathe. But if I do an off-center turning, that's going to detract from the beauty of the wood. Um, and of course, as you say, it depends on the, the type of wood you've got to what will make that feature in that wood pop, you know? Um, it, it's a very easy thing to say. It's an old cliche. It is such a personal, let's put the lads on as well. It is such a personal thing, design, what looks good, what doesn't. One of my uh, people I, I never aspire to, because I'll never get to her level, Cindy Drozder, the amount of technical um, work that she puts into her, what she calls her... Um, her finest pieces is absolutely amazing. Um, I don't put so much time in, but after hearing her saying that she sometimes spends two or three hours with 600 grit paper refining the little nuances on her finials, it gave me hope. Don't be afraid of using sandpaper or abrasive to refine those things. I did, it wasn't on this particular bowl, but on a bowl where um, I had a similar sort of a shape um, my tool work was having a little bit of a problem because there was a knot, not not a big crevice like this, but a knot in it. And I thought, I oh, know, I'll do it. It only was literally half a millimetre if that needed to be done because a little tiny bump in the curve and it just threw, it caught your eye. So I just took my time, inertia sander, sanded it away. Perfect, no problem. Um, I do with goblets quite often. If if I'm having not necessarily a bad day, but it could be the wood, could be anything, I get to a certain thing, I say, okay, I, I, I'm resigned to the fact, and I will start sanding with something like, I don't know, 180, and then just take my time and get it exactly as I want it. It, it. it does happen sometimes off the tool, but not that often to the, you know, to a finished piece. A little bit of sanding here and there, soften the edges here, maybe crisp on that edge up there. 
Actually, that's wrong. If you get a crisp edge, which you do with a skew, if you get it right, um, I, I barely touch it with sandpaper because I want that really crisp edge. But if I've got, I want to soften it for some reason, um, you know, use your abrasive. Don't be afraid because at the end of the day, nobody cares how you got there. It's the end result which they see, yeah. not 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 the process. You know. Um, I know I'm going on about it, but it's a, a, a not a pet hate. Sorry, that's the wrong word. It, it is something very passionate. I'm a passionate about. I'm not a color. I'm not an artist. I'm not a colorist. I'm not a joke about it. I have a lot of respect for guys that color. Um, I look at things um, and I am now at a level, I think, um, <laughs> just about where I can sometimes get exactly what I've got in my head. Doesn't happen often, but now I don't rush so much. Um, I take my time and uh lighter cuts um I, I got to a stage um about a month ago and i don't spend nearly enough time behind the lathe where i i actually realized i was rushing not just when i was doing a demo on a live i was rushing all the time everything i was doing uh, taking wood away getting it out of the way no and that was ruining my style it was ruining my technique so i stood back didn't turn for about a week came back in and I've slowed down. And the other thing I found myself doing, and I've said it countless times on videos and lives, when you hold a tool, you don't hold a tool like that. You hold a tool like that. Firm, but like an egg, basically. Loads of things happen as a result of that. You have more fluidity, more flexibility. You don't get pains in your shoulder and your arms and so on and so forth. And if you get a catch and you're holding like that, it's just got to go. Bloop. If you're holding it like that, it's got to dig in and it's got to rip the piece off the lathe, possibly. So all these things that I've been preaching about, uh, I was, uh, you know, I was guilty of. Not all the time, but a lot of the time. So now I. I'm consciously how I'm holding my tool, how I'm positioned, everything, because it's easy to forget if you don't turn on a regular, regular basis. And the same with design. You look at something and you want to get that design and you can't damn well get it. It doesn't matter what you do. You can't do it. You fall off the cut at the end or you start digging in at the end or something. And it's all to do with your technique. And you hone your technique by practicing. And please don't think the people that are here that I'm preaching, I'm not preaching. I'm just trying to convey the trials and tribulations that I uh, occur and hopefully can give you not an answer, but a reason why and possibilities of getting through it sort of thing. Um, possibly two or three times in 10 years, I have thought, that's it, I've had enough, you know, I've had enough of, um, and the reason I had enough was because I was spending any spare time I had, either doing a video, didn't do lives then, uh, and in those days, it might take a day to complete a video, a day and a half at the time you've edited it and everything. Uh, and then it's back to work. So you no practice. So now, if I can't put a video up, and it, uh, I'll practice instead. I know it sounds silly, but then at least it means that I'm keeping and improving, hopefully, as well. But back to your question <laughs> about the design. Uh, in short, no, I don't think that the detail at one end of a stem has to necessarily i'm not saying it shouldn't but it doesn't always have to mirror the detail at the top okay that's my opinion but that uh, was the welsh version this is the bristol version I yeah can get this back on the screen okay find a glass you like where's my camera gone there it is hang on can find I a glass you like let me make Pete right. bigger let me make pete bigger here we are look we'll make pete Off bigger. camera there pete Give me camera. There it is. Go back. Yes. That's him. That's it. Right. Find a glass you like. It tapers. Here it's wider than it is at the base. As Mike's saying, it's a concave base. And it tapers in. But with glass, you can see through that and you can see the thickness change. You can't do that in timber. No. So stick a detail in there. Stick a fillet in there like Mike does or did on that yeah. one. Yeah. There's something there to, to mimic this translucence yeah i i, I totally and, agree with what you're and saying it was something that just looks and feels right yeah uh, it doesn't matter what your design is as long as it pleases you yes unless of course as i said at the beginning you're doing a commission or you're doing something to a design yes. that somebody wants then you have to bite the bullet and do it i mean our own homegrown steve jones does lots of work which he i won't say doesn't enjoy turning but would not do at a choice but it is the customer's choice 
it's the customer that pays in the money to do the job, so you do the job. Um, with with us, or the majority of us anyway, um, as I say, you're able to put your thoughts eventually into a piece. And, um, you know, if you look at the first piece you turned when you first turned anything and look at the t pieces you're turning now, um, there's there are subtle differences in those. Even if the pieces you're doing, one of the pieces you do now isn't what you want, there will be a subtle difference in there somewhere which you wouldn't have achieved two or three years or two years or six months previously. Um, the goblets are a thing. And the only reason I got that name of um, Goblet Master was no other idiot was turning goblets in the quantity that I was and putting them on YouTube. That's the total reason. I mean, there are far, far better goblet turners out there than I'll ever be. You know, they've got, they've got more talent in their little finger than I'll, I'll ever have. But... I have got a fascination with them. I, I go off them a little bit for a while and then go to bowls or hollow forms or boxes or something. But I always go back to goblets. Uh, it just gives me a great... I just love them. I really do. But I, I've never turned a goblet to drink out of because they're not... For me, they are there as an object uh, to be looked at, to be thrown out of the window or something, but not to be used as a utensil. Um, you know, that's personal but that's just me again. But I'm fascinated and I got hooked with the design factor of them. And I'm not one of these technical guys that will do vector drawings and all this sort of thing to get them, you know, the, the golden mean and everything else. But they do tend to be in thirds, unless they're a long stem goblet, because then you'd have to have a bowl that big. But um, the average goblet that I do, by thirds, I mean the bowl and the foot will be virtually matching in dimensions and then it all depends how long the stem in the middle needs to be to make it balance in my view i think the point i was trying to make in the very beginning is that there are very few if any situations where i would turn a convex foot um might shock you but that's it i've never turned a convex foot on a finished piece ever um the only possibility, and in the chat put down if you think there are others, would be, as I said, something like a chalice, um, you know, a, a, a fairly robustly shaped chalice where you've got that little foot at the bottom and you see them in a film sometimes, then yes, there is a, but I still don't think they are aesthetically pleasing. But that is one instance where... Yeah, I tend to agree with you, Mike. I think they look yeah. unnatural. Yeah, they do. Uh, it, it, but again, it's like everything. I, you know, I've been to art galleries before and I look at art and there's people there and they, they're sort of like saying, oh, you can see this and oh, look at this. And I look at it and it looks like someone's gone with a paintbrush and gone like that, you know. Um, but, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder in that respect, you know. Yeah. Uh, the thing with he's got a question there yeah more of a statement really he's saying that he's hanging on for dear life to his tools he's who's this who's that eric, eric. hello eric how are you mate eric says uh, for the rest of you uh, relax while relaxing while turning is important it is so important it really really is um I, i'm not harping on about me 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 all the time but wh when i put that thing on facebook that i was just taking a, a you know standing back a bit and sort of regrouping um i, I honestly I, I found myself in such a state i was getting um it, it followed a live i did um well I, I just couldn't get the tools to work for me and the only reason was i was trying to get things done too quickly and i was rushing uh now um, you must probably know I got a, not a catch. I got a bit of a skid back there when Mark asked me the question. Um, it didn't bother me at all. You know, when I go back and just nice and gentle, remember what you need to do. Just get that little bit of an entry. You don't go at it. I'll show you something if I may. Um, when you when you're doing an entry on here, I mean, as I say, this is a half inch. F forget the goblet now. We're not on about goblet design or anything. If you want to start this again. I've got nothing to reference here. There, There is no shoulder or anything there to reference. I mean, one of the cheats is to get your parting tool and put a very tiny groove in there. But you want to start the cut. I mean, I have done videos on it before, but 
it is so important. If I've got to do it wrong now, okay? So if you sort of push in, you've got to get that sort of a situation because you're not giving the... But if you put that point in very gently, you go in at 90 degrees, very gently on the square, and just make a bit of a... Then just twist. Pick your bevel up. Don't force it. Now I've got bevel contact. And I'm not going to go all the way down because it'll bore you. Now I'm on my way and I can carry on doing what I want to do. But if you go in uh, too too quick, and you've got to get all sorts of things going wrong. But as I say, as a little aside, if you've got a thin part, well, it doesn't have to be a thin parting tool. If I want to start here, let's say, that's not a thin parting tool, Walt. Um, if you... Um, um, Glenn Senior's joined. Hello, Green. Door 60's joined. Oh, good evening and welcome. W one message, a personal thing to Glenn. Unfortunately, on the date you gave me, I'm actually working. You won't believe it. I'm off on the sick at the moment, would you believe? But I am actually working on that day. I'm sorry about that. If you just make a very small mark like that, that immediately gives your tool a reference. Now, if you want to skid back, you only got to skid back as far as there, look. So then you can start your cut and you can go on because you've got something to reference against even that little shoulder there I don't know if, if I do the camcorder yeah you won't see me doing the cut but you'll see what I mean you can see that that shoulder there little shoulder there so go back to the overhead um, and if I use that as a, a, a block if you like stop me going back I'll, I'll do it on purpose look it's going back it's going back I can't get in there no I can get in there, do what I like virtually, because it's not going to go any further than that shoulder. And then I can pick up a cut and I can carry on doing my cut. Yeah, so those are little things that you can, um, you can experiment with and try. One of the harder, it's a bit like starting, uh, joining a motorway and leaving a motorway. One of the hardest things or one of the most dangerous things on a motorway or on a freeway as you say over the pond is joining that freeway you know you're going at a relatively slow speed in comparison to all the cars whizzing by you um, and same on here the hardest thing is the start of the cut so you want as much assistance as you can whether you use that little groove does it matter if you put a little groove in? No, it doesn't. It doesn't make a hapeth worth of difference. And then you can start to say, right, well, if I go in very, very lightly with the point of the tool, I'm not putting any pressure on it, literally just touch the wood with the point of that of your tool and the spinning wood will make a very small indent. Then that gives you a reference. And all you've got to do is twist ever so slightly and then the edge will take and you can start to make your cut. The big problem with that again is what happens is as soon as you get that that confidence that you've got bevel you start to push and that's where it goes all haywire again because you're pushing too hard for what support you've got. Um, but all those things come with um, practice if you like and watching other people make mistakes and rectify them and so on. I honestly feel that um, goblets especially are a very personal thing you know um i quite uh, that's not an og by any means this is just a practice piece which i'm going to put on now and bore you a bit further uh you see there's a, a wormhole there in the stem a uh, little wormhole but uh i quite like the sort of the trumpety shape but the important thing to me, that's too big at the bottom there. Uh, fillet is too big. But I just did this for something else, not nothing to do with this. So it is to do with the bases again. Whether what sort of base would look good with that sort of shape. You know, we've done that um, that one. We've done that shape, and I still think even even with that fairly large, and I haven't spent time on it, that transition point there, I still think that works. Um, I mean, I could, if you wanted me to, I could replicate that to prove my point, but I think it's, it, I don't see the point. I, I personally don't think it's necessary to have to re replicate all the details that you have on there, personally. Okay, are there any other questions before I carry on? No, not at the moment. No, that's good. Okay. 
Good God, we're, half, we're halfway into the England match and I still have just under 100 people here. Well, thank you very much. I am absolutely overwhelmed. Uh, Brickos Cross, hi folks. Hi, hi, hi Brickos. Okay, mate, that's good. thanks for popping in. I appreciate it. <laughs> you do your grocery shopping. Don't forget anything. Uh, Gerard, good evening. Quick question. Is practice just good enough or should you really get someone? Of course you should. Um, Gerard is asking whether practice is enough or whether you need tuition. Um, I personally, as shows, have never had a lesson. Um, I'm all self-taught and it's taken me 10 times longer than it would have if I'd had some lessons. Um, I'm fortunate that I've got some very uh, very good friends that are and you know they've given me verbal advice and I've watched them turn at shows and stuff and I ask questions there but I honestly believe that there is absolutely no substitute for two things if possible get one-to-one -one, not a group one-to-one -one tuition in my opinion and number two is join a club I mean, obviously, with COVID, that is not really been a possibility. But um, and, you know, the best will in the world. I've done a few um, sort of one to one lessons with people um, during the COVID period. And yes, they found that they, they, they said they took something away, but it would have been nothing uh, like if they visited me or visited a pro turner for tuition. Um, invaluable but practice is the key it's no good going and have tuition and there's all oh, right okay and never do it again you've got to keep practicing keep practicing keep practicing i would always make the comparison uh not just steve jones people like jimmy clues all the bigs you know um uh the the pro turners martin saban smith wayne the wood turner is not a professional turner but he's been turning 30 odd years and it shows it shows in his confidence, his tool presentation, and so on. Um, Pete, um, oh, where are you there? Pete, who's not there, that's Mark. And Mark's been turning two years or whatever. And I think it's only about two years. And Mark has come on a train, but he has been under the watchful eye of Wayne, and Wayne has passed his knowledge on to Mark. Uh, Pete's been turning about 30 years. He's a very accomplished turner. Um, but they practice. Not quite 30, I'm not that old. Oh, I thought you started. I thought you started when you were forty. Sorry, um, <laughs> <laughs> you asked for that. Um, you know, it, it's all. Steve Jones has been turning, you know, for thirty-three, thirty-four years, and it's muscle memory. And I say this time and time again, and I get tired of saying it, but I'm not tired of telling you, is that you cannot get to any level unless you practice, um, and you know that that's it. Uh, that that is the be all and end all of it is practice but going back to what you said gerard no it is not a substitute for tuition but it is a, a very very good discipline to maintain i mean peter said to me before when he's doing a production run for you know one of his customers um he will he'll get in and he will practice you know do some beads some coves get back to used to using the tools again and go something as small as the correct tool rest height for that particular tool it only needs to be half a millimeter out you only need to be stood half a millimeter taller or shorter have your stance that little bit different and things will not be as you expect them to be they won't be drastic but they'll be that hang on this is not going quite as sweetly as it should and don't forget it's something that wayne robo and um, robo's an australian uh, production yeah, turner yeah, I know, Robert, yeah and myself all agree on <laughs> If your cutting isn't going right, put some scrap on the lathe, exactly. cut some beads and coves, yep. and practice. Yep. The more practice you do, the better, and it doesn't exactly. matter how many years you've been turning, yeah. get that scrap on there and, and cut it. Totally agree. And I think another thing as well, which is very, very important, is try and understand what is happening to cause you not to do it as you want to do it. In other mm. words, the cause of the problem you're having. Uh, try and work out because normally a lot of people say well, right when I'm turning uh, when I'm hollowing out end grain okay um, I get a problem with end grain I get it I will guarantee you once you start your cut everything is going fine it's when you get deeper it's when you get deeper it's when you get deeper my answer normally is and it's the same with me if I get things a little bit wrong 
it is not your presentation of your tool is not as it was when you started or you haven't altered that presentation to compensate for the shape you want or whatever the case may be it is purely where your cutting edge is at that specific time which is going to cause you to have a problem whether it be a catch or just a deviation from shape or offline or come off the cut whatever there is always an explanation and a lot of people won't actually sit back and say well what's happened i started off okay and by the time i got an inch in it started to judder you've lost bevel contact more than likely that's all it is you've lost bevel contact purely and simply because as you're going around that way you haven't moved your body with it so where the bevel is in contact at the beginning of your cut right it's it's, it's there and by the time you get to there it's you want to go around that way well you've got to keep bevel contact you can't just go like that and hope it's going to work because you're going to have air between the bevel and the wood because you're moving it either too much or you're not moving your body enough but there's always a reason um, and it's it's understanding your mistakes or your errors and knowing what you need to do to overcome them that's the important thing and that's the beauty of having a one-to-one -one. because somebody can sit there who was stood over your shoulder and they'll stop you immediately and say, no, do this, do that, do that. And you go, oh, yeah, that's better. And that's what you need to do. And then when you're on your own, back in your own workshop, and you make that same error, you'll hear that little voice in your head. Ed Oliver, for example. Well, you wouldn't understand what he was saying if it was Ed Oliver. So, you know, a normal, a normal RPT. But no, you, you, you know what I'm saying? That little, little voice in your head. And my little voice in my head now is me. And it's saying... Don't grip too tight. You're going too quick. Turn the lathe up. Go slower. And that is my karma now. And it works mostly. Not all the time, but it's improved. And you need to do that. You need to have a little system where things start to go wrong. When you did it yesterday perfectly, today you're not doing it perfectly. You're the same person. You're just doing something different. God, I have to get my soapbox now. That's better. Ian in the shed has joined. Good evening, Ian in the shed. How are you? Welcome, my friend. Welcome. Brian Hardwood, practice makes permanent. Yes, only perfect practice makes. <laughs> That's why it's good to have lessons from an accomplished turner. Totally agree, Brian. Totally agree. I think the, the thing is, uh, people like myself um, can teach the basics, you know, because. Uh, I'm one of these. I'm one of these know-alls that knows what to do, but don't always do it myself. But I can pass it on to people. Uh, but a professional turner um, who's got experience with actually teaching and knowing everything to the nth degree, you can't beat it. You just cannot beat it. Okay. Um, so that's. Uh, I'll just come off here a minute, and you can talk to the lads. Um, right, we'll put the other one on now, I think. So I might finish this one at some stage. Can you the camera then? Well, uh, if, you want to see, if you really want to see me, I suppose I could. Yeah, you too. <laughs> so I'm going to take this blank off for now. And don't forget, people, if you've got any questions, you want to go back on anything, I'm here to please, here to answer any questions. And in fact, if you want me to do something different that I'm actually doing, you know, so, well, can you try that? Will that work? Uh, you know, these are just practice blanks. So I might get something out of them at the end. And if I don't, it's not the end of the world because they were here for this reason only. So... Also, it's at that point where we we tend to remind people that if you like what Mike's doing, to show your appreciation and to help him maintain the quality of his demonstrations, there is a link at the top of the chat where you could buy him a coffee. Uh, it's cheaper and easier than using the super chats. Cheers, Mark. Um, what we were saying earlier on, you know, about, okay, I, I know that... Um, this wood is dried out since yesterday because it's fairly wet wood, uh, oak. But um, so it's not going to be running true, as we can see. Now, just the cup. I just want to reiterate this because obviously I tend to prefer to use a tennis ball because I do for no other reason than, yeah. So, okay, I've just put a very small amount of pressure on there. 
and it's still fairly the forget the stem because that's going to be warped a bit it's not it's not centered it's not true now this is where if you use i think this little chappy because it has a taper and it will sort of self center the um the cup of the goblet because this is quite thin it's only about two or three mil not sanded before anybody says it's just just been dug out for the for tonight now there's a problem there because i am not getting full contact there so i'm not the um although having said that as luck would have it i've got it smack in the center normally i would be relying on that taper to sort of just slip in very slightly and that would center the cup but i've gone in with that now very luckily i'm not putting much pressure on and you see that now i'll go to the overhead and you will see that the goblet cup is hardly out of true at all it's only very very slightly nothing major but the main thing for that again is going to this uh, centrifugal force inertia whatever you whatever it's called as it gets quicker that vibration is going to get bigger 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 and it's going to fly off the lathe so put in some support even if you just put in a live center with a little bit of the pc mouse pad on the tip to stop it if you haven't got a removable um uh, center just to give that little bit of uh, support in the cup area okay now it's again technique okay now this is really not very good as far as central is concerned now i'm not too worried because it's fairly thick there but i'm still going to use a bit of support i will prove to, uh, it, it might fly off okay if it flies off it flies off who cares i'm going to use my um skew here just to say that let's say you want to go you had to go to bed you couldn't finish your goblet you come back the following day you've done this bit now i always maintain that you finish you work your way down when you've turned your first thing you do is turn the outside shape roughly and then you refine it then you hollow out and i've got a little um example to show you in a minute okay so you work your way down the stem now previously and i'll go back to my ugly face previously i always maintained the, the only thing I do maintain is that you should finish the inside of the goblet once you've sanded it. That's the first thing. Get it done, out of the way, job done. Then you work on the outside. And I used to say, right, you do the goblet bowl, and then you sand it, sealer, wax, whatever you're going to put on there, uh, to that fillet, and then you work on the rest of it. And you sand the stem as you go down. It's not necessary, I find. It is a waste of time almost. Um, what I tend to say now, especially if you can get some support at the end, is um, do the inside, do your outside, finish all your, your tool work, and then sand up. If it's an extremely long goblet, uh, thin stem goblet, then maybe that's the one scenario that I would still maintain work your way down even with the sanding. Um, but to be honest with you, with most goblets that are fairly stable, that's not necessary so you can do the whole operation in one right the way through but always maintain that support at the end in my opinion because it's there why not use it unless you're doing a demo like uh was it jimmy clues did it i think it was jimmy clues and he was doing a long stem goblet with a um a similar bowl to that except i would a bit thin there can you see the <laughs> see the light through it <laughs> um and he was showing the uh, vibration and the, how good tool work you can actually not have support. And his goblet was about that long. And the stem was about, I don't know, six mil, seven mil. And it was wobbling like hell. But he was doing things that most of us wouldn't be able to do because his tool control and his lightness of touch was second to none. But I'm not to that level. And with respect, I doubt any of you are. So use all the tools in your armory to give you support and make it a better experience for you. Um, right, we go back to the overhead again now. And if I want to move down here, yes, I can, if I can find it, I can use um, a skew chisel. I've got my little half inch one here. But you see, to get to get that at the sort of level I would want, it's not too bad actually 
Okay. Now, I'm using no support at all. I'm bearing in mind there's a little knot there, so it might break it. If it breaks, it breaks. You know, it's not a big deal. But if you use light touches with your skew, I mean, it's bouncing against the skew. That's not the pressure of the cut. It's because it's not true. Now, I'm using the heel and just a little bit of the bottom of the edge but I'm using the uh, the heel just to start the cut and then sort of twisting a bit into the cut. Now that bit there is basically true. So it wasn't necessary, and I venture to suggest, because I'm working backwards, I could get the whole stem. The whole idea of doing that was to leave it and do it today and show you about whether you need support to work your way down the stem and it's all down to touch and technique etc but it, it actually came out of shape a bit more than i thought it would overnight but never mind these things are sent to try us so okay i'm not getting the cut there now what the normal thing to do is right grab hold of the tool and really give it some welly that's when you get your error you just carry on and feather into the cut very light touch i'm not holding the tool hard at all just let the wood come down almost like if there's time later i've got to show you about a bowl doing you know with air how to handle that um and i'm not giving any support with my fingers i'm just using very very light cuts i'm not rushing although you lot have fallen asleep i don't care i'm not rushing and i have basically got that down but you can see where it's not true because you've got a step there yeah but don't worry about that because that'll sand out anyway but that's just because the whole camera, thing... which is closer to the work mike um not when i'm actually working on it um that's i'll do, the... I'll do. We'll, see the, we'll see the cut better from there yeah hang on a minute that's yeah you'll see the cut but not me actually doing the cut now if i go in there is that still in focus no so bear with me people um a little bit on the fly focus maybe because i always put focus on manual you see because what happened whoops hang on what happens is you um right, let's go back there and go to focus go to automatic focus that's better and then go back to manual focus now it's focused if you see what i mean okay so yeah, that's that's clear now, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. that's good. Okay, you. Um, oh, hang on. Sorry, I just might have picture in picture. No, this doesn't work. Never mind. Okay. Um, so w what I'm doing is just very very light pressure. Now you've got that step there. Now you know it, it's unlikely you're going to get rid of that step completely with the tool because you've got that out of balance um, in the stem anyway because of the, the drying process. Well, I, I'm talking rubbish, got rid of it. Okay, so yeah, it's worked. So I'm being very light and I can work my way back quite confidently taking bigger cuts now because it's... Um, I could actually turn it up a bit more without it flying off here. Yeah. And the same thing will apply if you have the um, not the courage, but you know when you have a, a piece that's unbalanced, a bowl that's unbalanced on the lathe, you can confidence. You, well, you can go through the wobble. Is what I'm trying to say is you can go through the wobble by increasing the speed. I don't advocate that, especially with the newer turner, but you do gain you tend to get a feeling yes if i do another 100 revs that wobble's going to go and it does so that means you're turning at a faster speed which is going to give you less air less chance of a catch it essentially but you have to be able to understand why that's happening and the same happens with the goblet um if the goblet starts to start i could do it with this one because i'm going to throw this away anyway um it starts to wobble essentially okay you go quicker it's got to wobble 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 and then you go through a what i call a sweet spot you're going quicker but it'll start to center itself and that is another way of of combating this sort of a thing but it that could be you know not warping like this it could be the fact that you know something's ha happened your tenon isn't as good as it should be or you haven't but it seated it back in the jaws in the same place um 
but there are several uh, ways of overcoming it, if you like. So we've got down there, and you could just carry on, or you can use whether it's a, th uh, a three eighths bolt gouge or a half inch spindle gouge, as I'm going to use here. Again, using the wing just nice and lightly, not trying to move loads of wood, and I can get the same result. Just by very, very light, 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 light cuts. And then I want to take more wood away. I'm being careful because, you know, it's not, it's, I'm not rushing. I don't need to rush. Take it down to there, and then you can carry on here. Go back, and because you're going towards the headstock, you can take a little bit more material. Um, that's why it's important to finish off your tool work from the tailstock end down. Um, because if I start doing this, which I'll show you in a minute, um, it's going gonna, it's gonna to have problems. But, just to prove the point, if I've got support, I don't know if it'll be central enough. Yeah, it's not bad. If I've got support at this end, I now essentially have solid wood at this end. So, where I couldn't do this before, I can now do it. It's got to ruin it, most probably, but I'm just proving that I can do the I can do the cut now quite safely because I know effectively my pressure is going towards the tailstock because it's giving it support. So there are many ways of skinning a cat, as they say. I mean, God knows why I'd want to do this, but I'm just proving the point that it can be done. Now this is look, listen. I don't know well, you can't hear it, but it's it's bouncing because it's really out of true. But you can just bring that down there. And this is only a practice piece anyway. It's going to be chucked away. So the point I'm making, I know I've got, I know I've got the stem. Nice. As soon as I take this away, it won't be nice anymore. And we'll still get the, the wobble. But you notice the wobble isn't in the stem anymore. The wobble's up here. Um, and because it's thin, there's no way, I mean, there's a lot of flex there. There's no way that I would start to uh, try and get this true because to be honest with you, um, no one is going to know that. It's not going to, it's not leading to one side. It's not going to be noticeable that you can't, um, you can see it's out of true, but the stem is now complete, it's, uh, success, uh, eccentric. So now as I'm working down all this from, from here to the base is going to be perfect. This is going to be slightly off. It's going to be moving slightly, but it's not going to notice when you finish your piece. But yeah. it's very... Sorry, go on. No, no, I was agreeing with you. Just oh, God. Yes. I must be wrong then. No. If Mark, if Mark Beckett agrees with me, I've definitely said something wrong. No, it's but yeah, I, I'm glad you, I'm glad you agree, Mark. But, you know, it's their, their support is a thing. When you're doing a bowl, everybody says, keep your, you know, and true. Keep it, if you've got a big out of balancing, keep your tail stock up. You've got two points of contact. You've got your face plate or whatever you've got there or even between centers. But you've got two points of contact. And get rid of that point of contact at the very last moment. Same when you're doing a finial. You're doing it on a, you know, there comes a point where you've done the point. You're working your way down to the onion, whatever. Um, so there comes a point that support's going to go because you've got to finish the very top of the finial and it's going to come away from the little bit of wood that's in the, in the, um, live center but you keep that there as long as you can because you've got that support then you've got to go to the fingers you've got to go to various other things for support as you're working your way down the piece and the same applies for goblets bowls not so much apart from if you're doing a thin wall bowl yeah um you've done your outside rough shaping etc or even finish your outside you've turned it round. why do you think you work your way down the bowl you finish that top bit let's say half inch first you get that cut as you want it to the thickness you want it support because you've got the mass of the wood in the middle because as you go further down you go the further down you go at that thickness if you sort of started doing it and then you oh i've got to go back to the top it's flexing already you're going to get flexing um and the same applies in goblets as well so Devise all the little things you can to keep yourself as supported throughout your operation as you can. So if I take this out, 
And before Pete says, I'll go to the overhead. There we go. That's all right. See, I'll give you. He's learning. A bit. <laughs> yeah, it's only taken 18 months for get there. Okay. Um, again, I've got to cover hollowing quickly, very, very, very quickly. Um, and the same thing applies with hollowing as well. Now, this again is wet oak, so it's most probably oh, not as wet as yesterday, but it's wettish. Oh, it's not too bad. Um, let's just say that that is a goblet and I want to hollow it out. OK, and I've, I've actually had questions about this. Not lately, in fairness, but people have said, you know, I've started turning the, and I get down so far, and I start to hollow out, and it snaps. Well, of course it's going to snap. Why is it going to snap? It's got no support. Look, it's moving already. So, if I take what I normally use to hollow out, either a half inch or a three eighths spindle gouge, this is a half inch, which is much too high. I mean, obviously, I do use um, the six mil carbide hollower as well. But we're talking traditional tools here. Now, if I use this half inch spindle gouge, okay, now I'm going to give a very, very light touch. And hopefully, it'll show you. Now, in the middle, it's not too bad because I'm, I've got the support here. But did you see that move? <laughs> No, you can see the vibration. Can you see it? Let's go to the camcorder. Camcorder, yeah. Can you see the vibration there? And I'm giving no pressure whatsoever. And I'm actually turning, I'm turning away at the most stable points. Now, if I start out here, just put my safety specs on, <laughs> just in case. Good plan. If I yeah, if I start out here, and believe me, I'm being, I'm only going to be very light. Now, can you see it moving? Yeah. There we go. That's what I wanted to happen, and that will happen. Um, believe me, however light your touch is, in a scenario like that, where you've got a stem of a possibly, I don't know, 6, 10 mil, something like that, you've done the shaping of your bowl on the outside, and you're merrily working your way down to see what thickness of stem you want, and you think, oh, hang on, i better hollow out. Uh, it ain't going to work. It's not going to work. I don't care how good you are. It is not going to work, because there's too you much pressure. <clears throat> And just made eating the shed a very happy, happy person. Just made what? Sorry. Written earlier, I've never actually seen one of Mike's infamous flying goblets. All right. There's many stories. <laughs> now you've seen one of you. Uh, well, I tell Dave, you, Dave Oti says he doesn't think he's ever seen that many shavings on your floor either. No, there's there's a day's worth there. I I spent quite a long time messing around yesterday. So yes, and uh, with my I, I put it this the reason is my bad back. Okay. Uh, that is why um, I haven't been sweeping. <laughs> you believe that, you believe anything. Okay, what was I going to do next? I did say, and I've forgotten. Oh, Halloween, that's right. And i got the piece here. Now, if we go back to the overhead again. Um, now, in a different scenario, or a different situation, um, again, for those who don't realise, the reason I've got a little mark there is just gives me some indication um, of where the jaws were seated when I took it out of the chuck. I mean, where I can, I always like to keep. Um, it was a bit small on that tendon, actually. <laughs> it's not a lot of, but it, it should hold OK. Now, we've got a bit of movement here as well, I think, haven't we? Yeah, we've got more than a bit of movement. Have we got a, I have. Right, just talk amongst yourselves. I'm just going to try and get it a little bit more central. So I'll take my faithful step center and stick it in the center. And just slacken the jaws off a little bit. I mean, it's a good tip anyway. Uh, if you keep your center point, 
then that might be running yeah that's much better that's much better so where you can bring your tail stock up and there you go it's a little bit but that that's the the drying out process he says with confidence okay now you've all seen me hollow out but there are very many ways of, of um, tackling hollow out, hollowing out. I mean, Pete and, and Mark both use um, the two methods of uh, the pull cut or the push cut, whatever. And I started over the last couple of weeks, and this is after a long time of turning, um, with this, this sort of a shape. Now I forget this forget this bit here because obviously what I tend to do if I have a sort of a, an OG shape on a goblet now, what I tend to do is get the bait because that's the hardest bit to get in my opinion from the rim. I mean that's not perfect. This is only a, a practice piece. Um, the rest sort of can follow, but that's the bit worst bit because you tend to get a step there. You get a nice clean crisp from the edge, and that edge would be here not not this bit here that would be there so there's a nice crisp start and then you've got to flow it down into the stem but you want to hollow out so i will hollow out when it's sort of that only the, in proportion about that much has been shaped on the outside i won't go any less than that because obviously i want stability for my hollowing um, and i'll hollow deeper than this goes obviously i'll hollow to about there and then i will carry on but hollowing what happened if I can go to the um, I watched a um, let's go back a little bit because they need a bit more light don't we um, I watched several times in the early years and since Jimmy Clues doing this uh, demonstration on a, a long stem goblet and I don't know why he came back to me and he came he was he came to doing the inside shape so he took a parting tool. He took a parting tool. Now I'll go to the overhead for this reason. There's the uh, way I want to go. I want to go this way here. Okay. And what he did was make a couple of steps, keeping that parallel to the side or uh, parallel to where he wanted the cuts to go. And he did one cut sort of in the middle, one cut nearly where he wanted to be, and then the final cut, and I'll go to the camcorder, you can see. So we do a, one here, one there, bearing in mind this is at the angle of where he wants to be getting his um, bowl inside and then to there. Now, I tried that a few times. It works, it does. And I, I by no means am I saying I'm better than Jimmy Clues, but for me, what worked or works better is using my half inch spindle gouge and going back to the what I'm doing here is my bevel is going to be my guide with regards to the direction I want this to go so if I go back to the overhead again what I want is to be able to start my cut at the edge and I want it to be where I want it if you like I need it to be going level with the outside curve here so again as i was saying earlier on what you do is you support you support the um the cut the trouble is you can't see what i'm doing can you um uh, yeah that gives you an idea doesn't it yeah. um so my bevel is now pointing in a parallel direction to the outside and what I was saying earlier on about what you need to do is your entry cut is all important. So you put no pressure at all and just score a line, basically, and then twist. Now I've got a cut. And now I can go in and I just push very lightly. Let the, jo let the gouge do the work. And that is giving me the start of my, let's go to this now. It's now given me the start of the direction of where I want to hollow out. And now all I have to do, and the added advantage is I have now got support. And all I have to do now is 
look over the piece to make sure that I'm going in the right direction, point the bevel in the right direction, pick up the cut, twist to get my cut, and carry on. It's not going quick enough. That's better. 2,000, 2000 revs. Okay. Um, carry on. And just work my way down. And when I'm when I start to take too big a cut, when I'm going to be going over the edge of my wing, not a problem. I can sort that out. But I need to get rid of that there, don't I? That that little what there. We'll just go in and push in, nice and gently. And that piece there that area there is as far as tool work is concerned forget the shape and everything else is finished and i can work my way down so instead of uh, and it's exactly the same way as as uh, idea uh, which mr clues was doing was just establishing where you wanted to go the difference with this is it's just going to be a basic shaping rather than going into out uh, into out now that that resonance there meant i was pushing too much so just nice and easy and go in, take it down further and I think you will see the point I'm making is that it's going nice and smoothly, fairly good finish and I wouldn't have this shape anyway, it would be a bit deeper than that but the point I'm making is you can do it with the entry cut doing a very fine uh, just scoring the surface of the wood to give that bevel a, a micro millimeter of support and then as you put a little bit of forward pressure not a lot too much and it'll skip out but just keep it going twist and start to get the cut and you can carry on down and i was i was working really well the other day and that's uh, that's what i'm going to be using for a while now because if if you've got a a fairly long piece like mark did a a, a live with a really you know quite a long goblet without any support and if you're doing inches, yeah. Eight, yeah and if you're doing that without any support you're going to get an awful an awful lot of resonance um if you fall off the cut or if you push a bit too hard it's got to be light cuts gentle and easy but if you i can't remember i think you did do the back hollowing didn't you yes well if you do back hollowing again my own opinion you're, you're like almost trying to, not trying but there's a possibility you could rip it out the chuck if you're doing a push cut then yeah you did as well oh you i didn't see that bit did i um if you do if you're doing a push cut again you're putting the pressure little that it must be but you're putting that pressure towards the headstock and to the massive wood at the base of the goblet so that's why i'm trying this it's like turning a bowl a little bowl basically but that entry cut on something like that works really well to get the um to mirror the inside shape to the outside because you can look over you can see uh i didn't get a lot of uh happiness with the happiness <laughs> a lot of joy with the parting tool having said that a lot of my practice stuff is old cracked oak like this so if he was using something like um, even ash, which is hard, but better to work, in my opinion, uh, when it's wet, some ash or some cherry or something, then maybe the parting tool. But it's just to get your um, parameters, if you like, for the thickness of the wall at the top, because like anything else, you can't go back to, like with a bowl, even if you've got all the wood underneath that bowl. Um, let's just say that's the shape you've done whoops where are we there um, and you want to go back uh, you, you're hollowing the inside and you want to go back up here when you've done that much you ain't going to do it you know unless you've got a steady rest where it will then yeah. solid it and Even that's the another steady rest, when you're spinning at speed and your wall is quite thin yeah it's, it's, it's no longer round it's oval and there's proof of the pudding and when you're putting um, an oval then you're you're at risk of um, getting a tool mark spiral down the inside. Yeah. Or going through the edge. Yes, exactly. I, I quite agree. And I think um, I have actually spent a lot more time on goblets than I had anticipated. Strange that. Um, so I think I'll, I, I won't go into the bowl thing now because we've been going 
um, an hour and a half already, and um, I don't want to keep you too long. So I think it wouldn't be it wouldn't be right. It wouldn't give enough credence to the bowl side. So maybe the next one, which will be in two weeks' time, will be on bowls in more detail than I was going to do here. Well, I didn't think I'd take as long on the goblet, but having said that, hopefully it was of use to somebody. Um, and uh, I don't know if there's anything else that I can show, really. I was going to say you were quite you, you demonstrated there with that last one. Mm. quite efficiently that with the thicker stem in place yeah the cup cup portion was much more stable yeah I, I, that let's put mark on that's that's the whole like the whole thing i mean i, I have always said um and other people not just me i didn't invent the wheel is that you want to keep as much mass um with any project when you're turning not necessarily thin but when you're you know when you're hollowing whatever you want as much mass behind you your cut to give you the stability that you need. I mean, it's not a fail safe. You get a catch, it might well go to pot. Well, that's, you know, that's life, that's turning. But um, give yourself as much chance as possible. I mean, I, I used to do back hollowing 90% of the time. Then I uh, discovered and got the six mil mini hollower from Simon Hope, uh, which is a carboy dish cutter, not a scraper. Uh, that's incredible, uh, and that is the basis of most of my hollowing uh, tools that I've got are all around the six to eight mil of Simon Hope stuff, and they're brilliant for that. But because I'm a boring old fart and a bit of a traditionalist, I do like to use my traditional tools as well. Um, and I've been I was back hollowing, back hollowing all the time. I never got to the uh, the proper back hollowing where you go up and down, up and down, and you're taking cuts on in entry and exit. I've never done that, but I have used quite a lot the push cut. Um, and when I saw this thing about you know when I started doing thinner, gob not all the time, but thinner bowls and that, and you want to follow that down. The Jimmy Clues idea was great because I mean it gives you a start and it gives you a guide of where you want to carry on going. Uh, but I, did, I again was get, not getting the clean and a, a cleaner cut as I could have, so I tried it with the old um, uh, half-inch spindle gouge and the three-eighths bowl gouge works well as well. Um, and just point that point that bevel in the direction you want to go, nice and very very light uh, entry cut, just to get that established bit and down, and it's brilliant. Really works well. Anyway, it's horses for courses. Everybody has their preferences. Um, and for the newer turner, by the way, I'm working with damp, wet oak, and I sprayed the um, bedways before I use it. I mean, I use this stuff, which is a, a Axminster dry lubricant, but any dry lubricant or a P PDFE based lubricant, because oak will rust and stain, go black on your bedways. So I mean, get it off, but it, you know, why, why do the work? <laughs> so always give a spray when you're doing wet wood anyway. Rob CP is asking, how do you do stems like three millimetre thick or less? How do I do them? Yeah. Um, Work backwards. Oh, sorry, yeah. Um, yeah, it's... I'll tell you what. No, not that one, because I'm going to keep that one. <laughs> Love a, I'll do a quick um, thing here. Bear with me. I won't, I'm not going to use this one, because it take too long there are several ways as i say when you when you're doing a um a, a thin put this old chappy on if you get the tool rest out of the way and don't snap it as i've done that before also in a demo with live people i'll tell you what the biggest biggest thing i ever did um or the worst thing i ever did is my first ever demo which was at ukis in 2016 my first demo in front of people there's about 140 150 people all sat around expectantly um and i had three attempts or four attempts to get my 10 on the right side <laughs> i was cutting it too small and the bit of wood was getting smaller 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 anyway that's by the by um yeah what well, what we need to do is there's one or two things. Now, th this, I think you'll agree, is fairly flimsy, yeah? Sure. Now, that, that, that stem, this is for Rob, and I, I'm not, you know, this is, if it goes wrong, it goes wrong, but I'm just going through the principles that I would use. That stem, and I don't use the batteries in these things anymore because they always go. That stem is 6 mil, okay? 
that's six mil there so there's about eight i should think all right so you want to get the stem down to three mil which is half that size well if it works on this because of this being here it might do um so what do i do bring up a little bit of support because bearing in mind you would not be doing this um Cool, the things I do. This is the actually things I do for you. You said you would use for us today, Mike. I did. I'll do anything. I really will. I, I, will. About doing detention. I will do anything. Okay, so if I want to do a thin stem, I would start off, now that I'm here, I would start off with, you know, that's not going to be, hopefully, now. The, see, the problem with this is we've got that wobble. So, I might, uh, might be able to get rid of that wobble. Let's just see. I'm using very light cuts, Rob. I'm not trying to force it. All I'm trying to do is to um, get this stem equal, um, in balance, if you like. Not necessarily with the cup, but just so I can work on it without it bouncing the about. Camera, Sorry? Give me the close-up camera. Um, I can do, but it, it won't show. Yeah, well. Does it? Is that... is yeah. Head, yeah. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. I've got such a lovely head as well. I, I'm afraid when I do things like this, I do tend well, to hunch, yeah, I hunch yeah. over my work, unfortunately. So it needs to come down a little tad. Now, bearing in mind, you're, you're working not too far, but you're quite a way away from the uh, tool rest as well. So, light, light, light cuts. I just want to try and get it... Um, balanced. That's the word I was thinking of. And I'm literally doing no pressure at all. Okay, so, essentially, that part now is stable. It, it is um, balanced. That's the word I'm looking at. Well, well done, Mark. Thank you. So, um, okay. Let's be pedantic. I must have taken a mill or two off there. That is now uh, five mil. And I'll tell you something, Rob. Um, on a goblet of this size, I wouldn't want to go any lower than that anyway. I don't know about you, but I would look silly. If you're doing a really uh, small, thinny thing, then fair enough. But it, at the end of the day, it's only kudos, isn't it? That you, oh, I, I can turn a three mil stem. But with that support here, and I'm quite confident I could do it. Let's not use the skew. Let's use spindle gouge. 3-8 spindle gouge. Now my spindle gouge is at 40 degrees, so what I need to do, I'm going towards the supported tailstock, and I'm using it sort of similar to a skew. I'm just working my way towards that end. Okay. Now that I think I would guess is about four mil, maybe maybe three mil. I don't know. So I can use I can use the um, the wing of the spindle gouge to do that work for me if I wish. But as soon as I'm able, if I'm doing a thin goblet stem, as soon as I'm able to get my skew in, I will use my skew purely and simply because it does the job, leaves a better finish. And I honestly feel I've got more control. With a with a bit more, I could possibly get in with a big skew now. you just got to worry about the uh, the heel catching the back. Um, you might just rub on it, it won't catch it. Okay, so just light cuts. No fingers needed because I've got support, obviously, at the chuck end. And obviously, at the tailstock end. Mike, yeah. 
John Colbert's asking, would it be easier to turn a stem that thin with it being held in tension, pulled away from the headstock? Yes. You know what that means? Yeah, indeed. Yeah, you can do that. And I'll be honest with you, I, was gonna, I forgot about that. I was going to say to you, um, when you, I have turned on occasion with, I mean, I, you, you, know, you can see what's happening. The whole thing is turning here. So this method is not the ideal method, but bearing in mind, I've got virtually no pressure there at all. It's literally just supporting the cup. It's not pushing down like this way. But the other way is to get the old masking tape. Hooray! <laughs> Um, and this is by popular demand. We're back with the masking tape. Yeah, actually, it, it is really too thin to do it with at the moment because I, if I put that, I'm going to have to put that in to give it support to put the tape on. OK, so get rid of everything out of the way. Get your masking tape. And with masking tape, as I'm sure you're all aware, you tape away from you. So what I you see that's moving already. Hang on a bit more support there there we go so if you just no we do it the other way what you've got to do unfortunately is you normally you'd have support more stem there so you could do this operation without i don't want it to be sticking on here at the moment because i want to pull it out but anyway we do it do it like this just take a little bit off here a piece off here this is just to give you an idea of the method very carefully turn it round. Very carefully. And then you just make sure that you're not touching um, your actual body of your life centre. What's, what's the rumour true that masking tape companies approached you and asked you not to do this again? Yes, I was, I was offered... For them. <laughs> I'll have you know, I was offered an undisclosed uh, six-figure sum never to use masking tape, tape on film. You were, you and in fact, it. I was actually asked to burn any masking tape I had in stock and never use it even on my own because they, think they just thought I might damage myself. So, um, so there. <laughs> so, would I answer your question, Mark? Yes, it is true. Okay. Now, what I would normally do, I think I handle that masking tape pretty well, you know. Um, a round of applause, please. What I would do is put another um, wrapping round here to secure it and another wrapping round here. So now we've essentially got that sorted. And again, by the same token, you're not looking at masses of pulling power because if you do that and the stem's fairly thick when you start, you're going to pull possibly the possibility of pulling your life center out of the quill. So you don't want to do that. All you want is a tight, a, a, a slight, and I mean a slight amount of backward pressure. That's why I would normally tape this way and that way because it will stop it coming off. So I'm just giving it a slight amount of backward pressure. OK, and then when I'm happy with that, then I would uh, tape around here as well, just to give it that bit of extra security. And I won't turn it on fast, but the point I'm making is it's still not um, it's not going to run center. You can spend time taping a bit further here, a bit there, a bit more tension here, a bit more tension there. But essentially, you're pulling away. The problem, I say the problem, the only thing, if that is the case, you cannot cut towards the tailstock. You can only cut towards the headstock because you've got no support there. Because if you start um, putting any force that way, it's going to basically compress that tension you've got there. So you will lose any support you've got. But although that's wiggling around, when this is taped down properly with a tape going here and tape there it's not going to come off it's going to give and what you said is right it's giving tension this way for a stem this thin okay so now we've got this done but i won't be able to do it because i haven't so that is another way i've got to take this off now the reason being is i want to carry on with the stem and so the same michael got um i play a show in particular BBC programme at the moment. On and what is the score? Um, don't worry about the score. 
Okay. As you got that tape to work, yeah, they were cutting the scenes of groups of people all over the country <laughs> that were jumping up and down, excited and waving their arms in the air because you got the oh. masking tape. Thing. Oh, so Italy yeah. must Italy must have scored then. <laughs> <laughs> no, they haven't. No, it's uh, one nil to England at the moment. Really? Oh, that's good. I'm pleased for you. I, I, I genuinely am pleased. Oh, I've got next to no interest in football at all. It is a great, uh, great achievement. In fairness, been one. Been one nil since the first two minutes of the game. Yeah, That's, that 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 doesn't necessarily bode too well then. Um, fingers crossed, eh? Um, I won't keep you lads too long now. I'm gonna um, gonna go off camera for. I got I got harangued again for vaping on camera. So I'll put you on. I'll put you on with the lads for a minute. There we go. There's Mark. Oh. Oh, good. That means I can't have a vape then. Yeah. You can if I speak. So if I speak, now you can, Mark. You need a quieter vape, mate. The vape is that loud, it takes over the screen. What you actually need to do is to lift your arm, lift your boom up so they can't hear you. However, anyway, guys and gals, um... Yeah, so what I'll do is, just for a couple more minutes, is just go down. <clears throat> I don't know if you can understand, a lot of people don't understand the fascination or the enjoyment that I get with um, with goblets. But the thing is, I mean, I think you'll agree, it was Rob that asked the question, that you know, uh, for a goblet of this size, that is a stupidly um, unproportioned stem. Yeah. Now you see, this uh, I gotta uh, gotta stop this in a minute. You see, it, it never ceases to amaze me in wood turning. Okay, it it would it would logically follow that with a stem which is now I would think approaching four mil, maybe a little bit under, or you know plus or minus, um, with that size of um, bowl at the top, to me aesthetically doesn't look good. Right, but talking about, um, as the gentleman said, was it Eric that mentioned that, about the tension? Uh, tension it wasn't Eric, was it? No, it was John Corbett. John Corbett, sorry, sorry, John. Um, it was John. John's point about pulling was valid. Now, you've seen here, just this second that I turn that on, that is running <coughs> truer than with the tension. So, okay, I would have had to have played around with the tension and could have got it better. But it, when, you, when you use a tennis ball or this or, you know, um, this thing from the rubber trucky, whatever, it's not pushing like pushing. It's just giving it the slightest amount of support just to give it that, that support, basically. It's, you, you're, not, you're not wanting to put any pressure down the centre as you can. And I think I can prove it now by saying that I could carry on as I will do, not for kudos, just to prove the point, I might be wrong, but I could actually carry on turning that stem that thin and maybe a bit thinner until I want to finish turning that stem. Because don't forget, what I'm doing now is towards the headstock. So the tension... I've really got to think about it quite hard because I'm not convinced that tension is always the best is is always the best option when you're even doing a thin goblet. Because don't forget your bowl is finished. You know this part this part of the of the goblet is finished. You're now concentrated on the rest of it, whether it's that long or that long or that long. It doesn't matter. I mean, I have done a I think it was three foot goblet was the longest I've done. Okay, the stem wasn't. It stem was about that size right the way through, but. I used steady rest for that. But there is proof where pressure towards the headstock, very, very slight pressure, is actually giving me a better result than tension because that is running true. The, the, the goblet bowl there is running true. This now is not as true as it was on the tension because it has, because the the goblet bowl wasn't running true. I got this running true. Well, now I've got this running true. That's not running true. An obvious situation to occur. And that's moving quite a bit. Um, if I go to the camcorder. 
yeah, you can see this bit's moving quite a bit there, look. But this is virtually, I mean, I can turn that up now quite confidently. And, you know, I'm doing, you know, whatever, 1,000 revs, 1,000 RPM. That, that is fine. There's absolutely no movement. Look, you can't hear a thing, can you? Whereas that, this might split that. You can't hear it, but I can feel a little bit of vibration. So, going back to, I better put the glasses on again, just in case it does decide to uh, take flight. Um, we've now got to, and please believe me, this, this is nothing to do with kudos. This is just trying to um, answer Rob's question in, in real time, if you like. We are now looking at four mil. Okay, so that bit there is four mil. What did Rob say? Three mil? Three, yeah. Mm, okay, he would, wouldn't he? Okay, um, I've got support here. So logically, that bit of a vibration, if you like, I should be able to get rid of. Going towards the tail stop. Just with very, very light cuts. And I wouldn't, I mean, I wouldn't do this normally. I'd be going the other way. But if I want to use a skew, I have to go this way because I haven't got enough room for the skew to get there without fouling that obnox <laughs> obnoxious bit of detail there, which is out of proportion, but it, it's not a piece that I'd be finishing. So, that's Let's got rid of the... Oh, cut it all towards the tail stock. Sorry? If I was cutting a thin stem like that, I would be cutting all of it towards the tail stock. Yes, you'd be going this way, wouldn't you? You start yeah. this way in there, but we, we started in the wrong place here, if you see what I mean. Well, you see, I tend to, I, I don't do that, Pete, and it's just me. What I tend to do is get all this bit done here, and then as soon as I get my skew in, then I just, yeah. I would normally go underneath, wouldn't have any um, support at this end at all, um, but this is going a bit, and then just work my way down. Yeah. Because I all, all my all my force is going towards the headstock. So once I've achieved, there's a that little knotty thing there, so it could break. There's a hole. Oh yeah, there's a there's a gap. There's a hole there. As you can see it, it's a, yeah. a bug hole. So I'm not going to go any further because it will break. But yeah, in answer to your question, Rob, um, and I don't care if it breaks. So I'm not going to keep it, but I just don't want it to break. There's no point, is there? You've seen one break tonight. And that's enough. <laughs> no. Um, in answer to in answer to your question, I use the skew. Not necessarily this one, but this one to start with because you can get in quicker. Uh, and unlike Pete, Pete does his thin stem goblets from headstock to tailstock. You know that's it works for him. That's fine. I always go from right to left towards the headstock to the supported massive wood. I do take it down, obviously, quite a bit. And uh, Jimmy, actually, what he does, he uses a parting tool to get approximate um, diameter of the stem he's going for as well, which is a very effective way of doing it. You're basically cool. parting off, you know, fine. Um, and it just cleans up with a gouge. So, yeah, there, there are many, many different ways of doing it. But I personally um, like to use the... Um, tailstock to headstock method, um, and that's just me. But yeah, you you can get down. I mean, I don't think Joseph's on now. I should imagine he's what. Jo jo oh yes, he is. Uh, Joseph will. <laughs> you keep saying, don't forget the captive rings. <laughs> I'll do a captive ring if you like. No, it's going on for two hours now, so that's enough. But um, Joseph does some very, very minute turnings. I mean, you know, tiny, tiny turnings with captive rings and everything else. Um, but when you start getting big, uh, you know, in size and thin, then you've got different forces at work. And as I said, like, <laughs> well, I did my, I've got to say this and then I'll let you go. Uh, when I did my first attempt at a um, off-center goblet, yeah, um, I was practicing 
and I thought, well, I don't want to go through the hassle of, of, of um, hollowing out the bowl. So I got the shape of the bowl, yeah. Um, and of course, that's fine when it's on axis. And then when I, you know, moved it in the truck to go off centre, it was fine. It was going great. And then as I was working my way down, of course, you've got this big lump of wood that's flying around the end, no hollowing out. And of course, it just went flying because the weight just made it do, as I said earlier on, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until the wood says, bye, and off it goes. But, um, yeah, I think everybody's got their own methods of doing things, and there, I don't think there's a right or a wrong method. There's just certain things you have to take into account, and then you do it your way, you know. it's um, That's the way it is. Uh, you don't have to go ultra thin to practice good tool control, Rob. No, that's very true. I agree, Mark. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Having said that, it does do you, it does your confidence good. If you get, I mean, I've turned, I'm sure everybody on here has done the same thing. You know, some pro turners say, just put a spindle on and turn it down to a toothpick. Uh, and, you know, basically yeah. uh, that's extremely good advice, you know, um, and I've done lots of it. I, I've got so many offcuts and bits that, you know, I haven't liked or whatever the case may be. And I'll go back to them and I'll just practice on them, you know. And I, I don't want to be seen as a sage. I, I don't think I am by any means. And I'm not trying to be big head or anything. But if you're doing a project and at time, it's not time critical, which most of our work isn't. Try a number of different tools on it. It's it's an option. I was r roughing these these things down yesterday, from you know uh, stock, and I used a skew chisel. I used a half inch spindle gouge, a half inch bolt gouge, and I did actually use the spindle roughing gouge as well. I used four different tools, just to you know get into it and. Um, in doing the stem, I've done stems completely with a spindle gouge wing. And um, yeah, okay, I did it, but I prefer to use the skew. There are so many different ways you could approach something. Yes, Mark, Pete. Pete was going to say something then. No, I wasn't. Oh, I didn't. Oh, he passed wind. <laughs> passed wind, that's all right. Oh, 1-1, one, one, says Brian. Come on, Italy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it doesn't matter. England beat Wales and Scotland anyway. <laughs> As, as somebody said, are you sure Wales was in the competition? It was so long ago they played. But yeah, it's not a national, it's not a national sport like it is you. Anyway, I'm not, I refuse on the my yeah, channel, true. no football and definitely no politics. A little bit of COVID has been discussed over the over the year, but not a lot. Um, guys, I have to honestly. Um, for, the, for, for you that are remaining here, and there's still 76 of you here, which proves how many people don't like football. Um, no, I'd like to thank you all for coming. I really, really do. And I, I hope you've gained something from it, enjoyed the banter and so on and so forth. Um, I'll make no apologies for going on a bit long with the goblets, longer than I intended to, but hopefully, you know, from everybody's input, both Pete and Mark and indeed guys on the chat and a little bit from myself, you've gained some some idea of, you know, some options. Um, and on the next live, which I'm hoping will be two weeks today, um, I'll go through, and I'm not a bowl turner, um, I'll go through the way I look at bowls aesthetically as well as some hints and tips on how to get what you want to get. So if there aren't any more questions, I'm glad you enjoyed it, Andrew. Thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Rob. Glad you enjoyed it, mate. Yeah, I'll tell you what, Dave. Uh, Dave said, thanks for doing it with a bad back. My back at the moment is not too bad. I can feel it twinging, but it's really weird. As long as I keep standing, I'll have to stand up in bed tonight and go to sleep with a <laughs> head against the wall. Because <laughs> I'm dreading tomorrow morning. I tell you, honestly, if you'd have seen me this morning, you'd have laughed. It was that bad. I was doubled up and it's slowly an hour and a quarter before I could actually take my own weight on my spine and walk properly. It was. <laughs> and when my wife said, oh, I'll unload the dishwasher, I said, no, I'll do it. You know, being a, you know, I'll do it. That took me about 20 minutes to unload the dishwasher. Being a hero. Because every, every, every plate was, oh, God. <laughs> and look at me now. I mean, I'm not too bad, you know. Look at me now. Yeah. You made a comment further up the chat, which I can't find at the moment. Yeah. Um, but 
you were on a general cut at the time, so I didn't want to say anything out loud. But um, when you were doing the hollowing out, yeah, uh, with the oscillating and having the mass behind it, mm. Mm. she points out exactly the same is true of hollow forms. Yes, yes, indeed, very much so. so oh, it was people... Miss T that said it. Who, Miss T? Yeah, and, and T, yeah. you're so right. Yeah, uh, I luckily, I say luckily, I, I love doing hollow forms. I really do. But in the first few times I did it, I did watch some videos from some people who were really good at doing, I can't remember who, but, you know, going back some years now. And I was guilty of that. You get so carried away with the outside shape, all of a sudden you've got sort of that much of a, a tenon, if you like, or that much holding it. Um, I mean, the tenon is whatever tenon. Uh, my advice for the hollow form is whatever size tenon or jaw set you think you want, go bigger. Because there's an awful lot of pressure on the inside well there is the way i hold it anyway not much, much finesse um but yeah it, it's very true when you will get those vibrations but the other thing that's why they always say and it's very true with a hollow form you get everything done you work away from the the opening to the base and you get everything to the right thickness on the way down as you go a little bit at a time because when you get to the base and you come back to the top it's going to start to vibrate like a bowl does like a goblet does boxes not so much because they got quite thick walls and they're quite stubby but uh, yeah it's a vase another thing too with vases you know if you do vases it doesn't matter if it's a straight sided vase if you're going quite thin you can't go back to the top well you can but you you tend to get those lovely sort of um robert sorby texturing tool effects you know yeah just that little bit of vibration but um gentle turns uh, put in there good thin stem equals dense wood and without the pith Yes. I would counter that by saying you always put the pith outside the stem. Exactly. But I've got one here. I don't know if you can see that, but mm -hmm. the pith is just there. Yeah. So I've got the pith in, in the piece of wood I used. Yeah. But I put it off centre so that the stem is in good wood. I was just going to say, if the pith is in, is in the middle, then you put your your holding centers just either side of the pith either there and there so it goes or just literally put it there and it just goes like that to begin with but the pith yeah. as you say has got to be outside your stem i have done actually a cherry believe it or not in the early days with the pith going right at the middle it was fine and i did it again without realizing it and it just went bing yeah. when it dried completely it just <coughs> went the pith just cracked cracked it but yeah it, it's it, it's no big problem if you um include the actually it's no big problem if you include the pith in the base so if you off center it and you're going to lose too much figure or whatever the reason may be so you're actually chucking out you know your, your your um your base is going to be where the pith is that doesn't really matter but it's always advisable to get the pith off the off your stem whatever happens you know um yeah good advice there pete you surprised me mate no <laughs> I just, yeah. that is the problem with these lives you see i mean i, I uh, enjoy the chat as well and um again a huge thank you to everybody but a, a really huge thank you to pete and mark because they both make my life a lot easier a lot less stressful know uh, what i mean it sincerely and if something goes wrong i say that they're making pete smaller on the screen no it's only because i if i stand here that's better let me make pete bigger then I? there we go he's a bit elongating mine but never mind yeah i'm fat than that really yeah <laughs> don't we know yeah. no but it, it it's um it's a great medium and uh i have neglected my audrey videos and people who come on here don't mind that but a lot of people don't like it but I'm not out for the views. I'm out to give people advice and to hopefully um, give them a bit of a laugh while we're at it. And as I say, that's why I am so grateful to Pete and Mark, because it makes my um, experience on here a lot, lot less stressful, a lot, less a lot more enjoyable. Uh, and hope it is for you too, because there's questions 
Colin Izzard, I didn't actually personally say hello to you. Hello, mate, and welcome, and thank you very much for coming. <laughs> Bit late saying hello, but there you go. Um, yeah, so that's what it's all about. And if somebody goes away with one thing that they didn't know before, then we've achieved our goal, I think. Okay. Right, guys, um, could go on for ages. Well, thank you very much, and thanks very much, Woodworm. I appreciate that. Hang on, Warren. Hello, Warren. New to being on here, but have enjoyed. Thank you very much. That's my pleasure, and thank you for coming. I appreciate it. It's a nice comment there from Philip J about as well about how you turn them onto traditional tools. Yeah, uh, um, don't get me wrong. Uh, who said that? Sorry, Philip J. J. Philip, um, hi Philip. Um, the don't get me wrong. I've got nothing against carbides at all. Nothing at all. In fact, I use them for hollowing, you know, uh, hollow forms and stuff like that. However, I'm just one of these. I started in the game late uh, and I just made it my goal to try and master as well as I possibly can traditional tools. And I get a we are uh, we have an online club called 2360 um, and Carl Jacobson did a demo for us last week. And, you know, he used carboids. But he loves using traditional tools as well as carbides. But he uses the tool that does the job best for him. And he explained that very well. And that is very true. If carbides work for you, that's fine. And, you know, they do for the majority of people. They're very user friendly compared to traditional tools. The learning curve is shallower. Uh, and let's be fair, if it gets somebody into wood turning, whereas a traditional tool might put them off wood turning, then, you know, go, go, go carbides, because at least they get into the craft. My personal opinion is that you should learn your traditional tools first and then dabble around with carbides, use them for certain jobs, that's fine. But don't ignore the traditional uh, tools, because I can assure you, when you do finally get a good cut and you do enjoy a sharp edge against to, uh, wood and getting a good finish it will give you the best feeling ever it really it really will and i still get that now about once every two months if i'm lucky <laughs> but it's a lovely feeling when you get it right um and practice will do it I'm not against carbides it's like color i'm not against color by any means uh, in the right hands it can do a wonderful job it just doesn't it doesn't float my boat um the majority of the time <laughs> Thank you, Edna. That's very kind of you. Thank you. Um, simple as that, really. But yeah, carbines are great in the right place, you know. So many different genres of turning. Yeah, no, I couldn't agree more, Rob. I could not agree more. It's like segmenting. I'm going over the two hours again now. I don't care. Um, the... Um, the segmenting thing. I, I'm in awe of some of the sem segmented pieces I've seen. I really am. It bores me to distraction cutting the same thing. So I'm not one of these people that can do that. Pat Carroll with his piercings and other people like him, Bin Pole, people like that. Absolutely phenomenal work they do. But the patience I haven't got. There's no argument. I just have not got that patience or commitment either. Um, and for me, it's a hobby. I, I, I've got so much to learn uh, of just like turning turning a bowl or, you know, turning a, a spindle down to round. There's still things I want to learn. There's little bits I need to improve on. So I've got a long way to go yet. And I just want to get that done. I, I don't want to branch off too much. But, yep. um, I know. agree with that. I'm too old to be doing segmenting work. Well, you know, I've got the time with the patience. It's the patience with me, really. I mean, I, I, I built the jig years ago. Built the jig, and I was cutting an eight-ring thing, or a, yes, eight, an eight-segmented ring. You know, I was, and on my did the eighth one. I thought, you know what, I'm not enjoying this, so I never use it again. And that was eight years ago, seven, eight years. Yeah. Anyway, that's yeah, I think we all pray with these things, but you've got to try everything. I, mean, yeah. I bought. Um, I always forget the name of them. The um, what J uh, J Jamie Page uses, uh, not jigsaw. You know what I'm on about. Um, scroll saw. Oh, scroll saw. Right. I saw that. And I thought, yeah, great. And when um, when Paul very kindly sent me that 
thing of me, um, you know, which he scrolled sword out, took him hours and hours and hours. And you see Jamie Page doing the Queen, and it looks like a you know brilliant work, brilliant work. I have got to get a scroll saw. Got to have a go at that. That'll be handy for this, handy for that. I got it record power entry level. Used it for about not a week solid. I used it for about a week, and I put it up on eBay. I lost thirty quid on it, but I'd had a go of it. Didn't like it and sold it. You know, but um, it's not something I want. Maybe once a year, I thought, oh, I'd be handy if I had a scroll saw to do that little job. But nah, that's not uh, not me at all. John Cole, in all seriousness, so I made a segmented and coloured bowl recently. I enjoy the colouring segmented, not so much. John, honestly, that was brilliant. What, what, look, whatever you enjoy, do it. That, that's my advice to anybody. Just because I don't like it, it doesn't mean, you know, everybody enjoys what they do. You know, um, hopefully they enjoy what they do. Because that's what we're here for. We're here to enjoy ourselves. And uh, I totally agree. And John, uh, Rob's saying, is, you know, it's good. It's, Good that we're all different. It'd be a very boring world if we all had the same opinion, you know. Yeah. It's like it's like critiquing stuff. I mean, there's there's ways to do it not to put people off ever picking up a gouge again. But if something is is wrong, um, or is not right in your opinion, then you should say it. Um, I. But there are ways of saying it. You know. Um, it can be detrimental if you, if you're too harsh to, to a new turner. But I mean, there are things. Um, what I do is, is is good. If I like something, I'll put it up, you know, or I'll put it up for sale, or whatever the case may be. It doesn't matter. Um, and I think, oh, you know, that is actually the best of that type of piece I've done, in my opinion. I love it. And then I get somebody saying, well, I prefer this, I prefer that. Don't get upset about it. Think about it and think, well, yeah, okay, maybe. But to my eye, I'm happy with that, you know. And I've put stuff up on Facebook on other people's stuff and I've said, yeah, that is spot on in my view. And then some somebody down the bottom said, yeah, but that's fine. You know, if you put stuff out there in the public arena, you've got to be prepared to take critique, you know, yeah. um, and 99% of people don't critique to be nasty. They critique to give you a bit of advice or in their opinion, it would look better or would it, wouldn't it look better this way? You know, it's like, um, I can't, it was not Eric, was it Rob? Or saying about the foot, you know, should, should oh, the end of the stem, should it be the same as it? Yes, of course it can be, and it works very well in certain instances. Um, it doesn't have to, in my opinion, but that's just my opinion, you know. Um, and if, well, you are, that, some people prefer that as a foot, you know. I don't. I think it looks yeah. terrible, but that's just me. And I have seen some lovely goblets. And then you sort of look at it, oh, it's beautiful. Look, oh, God, they've got a clump foot. <laughs> uh, uh, dear. But that's just me. I said that. I've obviously got horrible taste because <laughs> you if are. I went to a craft fair with 12 bowls, six I liked and six I hated, hmm. I come back with the six I liked and the six I hated myself. They're honestly. I, I, Everybody's got different tastes. Of course they have. Of course they have. I mean, I, I, I'm not saying this to name drop, well, not name drop in a sense. I've, I've got six items permanently, not the same six, obviously rotating in an art gallery in, in somewhere about 10 miles away from me. And I mean, some of the stuff in there, some of the artists in there, I mean, they are they are pucker. They are proper artists, you know, and there's me. Um, and I've got a couple of holoforms in there and a couple of this, a bit of that. And, you know, it, to me, it's silly money. You know, I wouldn't pay that for it, to be honest with you. But there we go. And I've sold a couple, couple of three items, and that's fine. I don't do it for any other reason. It would be sitting here or in the house. So, okay, it might as well sit there, you know. Um, but some of the stuff I see in there, to my eye, I mean, you're talking maybe three or four hundred quid for something. Jesus Christ. Yes, I can understand the work that's got in it, but it doesn't look, you know, to me, it's not, you know, it, it doesn't do anything for me. And yet you look back in the catalogue in a couple of weeks' time and it's gone. Somebody's bought it. And that's fine. Art is, not art, but design or aesthetic or anything is a very, very personal thing. Um, it's subjective. It is. It is very subjective. I keep going back to Cindy Drozder. I mean, she has, she has almost made a life's work of it. You know, and she, you can go into all, but in fairness, all her stuff is pleasing to my eye. I don't think there's anything she's done that I've seen that I think, oh, bloody hell, I don't like that. 
I, I might refer one piece to another piece, but when you analyze all the elements in that piece, everything is, is spot on. Now, for me, I, I'm a hobby turner. I'm not artistic, really. That is not my enjoyment. My enjoyment is one in 10, getting that onion on a finial just right, just perfect. I can get them just nearly right <laughs> most times, but getting them, well, I, I look back and think, right. And you know, I've got a couple I've done that I won't put on anything until I turn something that they'll fit on. I've just got them put away, you know. Um, and But then I'll bring that out and think that's perfect. And somebody's going, no, it's not. That's not right, you know. So it's very subjective. Anyway, guys and gals, um, I think it's time for me to let you go. Um, I've really enjoyed your company. Thanks very much for the very um, pertinent questions. I uh, hope you've learned something. Thanks again very much to Pete and Mark. Um, and all being well, wind behind us. I'll see you two weeks tonight. You take care and good night to you all. Bye, everybody. Cheers, everyone.